invite you this morning to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 1. We're going to finish up this series in Acts this morning, Acts chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse 15, and we're going to read all the way through the end of the chapter. To give you some context to this, this chapter is helping us understand some things that happen as Jesus, after the resurrection, if Jesus rose from the dead, spent 40 days with his followers and then ascended into heaven. He had some things to say to his followers and uh, concerning an assignment for them, giving them first the assignment to wait and then to wait for the Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit comes, then they were to go and to be witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. After he said those things, he was uh, taken up into heaven. So what the disciples did after they witnessed that ascension, they did just like he said. They went back to Jerusalem as we looked at last week, and they went to an upper room, and they began to pray. And then as a result of some of that prayer time, Peter is going to address his followers that are assembled there. And we pick it up in verse 15 where he says, In those days Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the, scriptures had, the Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all of his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that field was called in their own language a word that means filled of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, let there be no one dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who, have who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of those men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, who knows the hearts of all? Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. The thing in this text that reaches out and grabs us as Peter is standing up talking to his followers is about the actions of Judas Iscariot. We don't hear many sermons about Judas Iscariot, do we? But we're going to take a look at this today because I think there's some things we have to be cautious of in our own lives and we'll be pointing some of these things out over the next several minutes. You see in your uh, outline that's been enclosed, it was written, the Gospel of Mark, Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Warren Wiersbe gives us some food to think on as he wrote, 
If you're not born again, the day will come when you will wish you had never been born at all. This is why it's important for us to look at this text today. And perhaps as we begin thinking about what, we, what we're going to find in Scripture today, we begin sort of at, at this place of the story. It happened on an early Friday morning. There in Jerusalem, sometimes between midnight and dawn, The Jews are finished with Jesus now. They've arrested him. They've had sort of a kangaroo court. They have finished. Trumped up charges and the false witnesses, those things are behind. Jesus has been interrogated by Annas and also by Caiaphas. And they had a verdict. This man is a blasphemer. He deserves to die. Now, they could not sentence him to die, so they had to take him to a third person. That would be Pilate, the Roman governor. He's the only one that can order Jesus to be put to death. Since this this dark hour, there's a man in the shadows. For the most part, he's, he's now been forgotten, and he's watching. Like for many of the people that evening, it had been a long night. And probably for Judas, let's put our, ourselves maybe how he may be thinking at this point in time. This may have been the longest night of his life. Probably it was just six or seven hours ago he had left that upper room where he had been with Jesus and the other disciples at the Last Supper. And when he left that upper room, remember Jesus said, Judas, go do what you're going to do. As immediately as he left that upper room, he went to the chief priest to make the final arrangements of the betrayal. It was Judas Iscariot who led the soldiers on a short walk across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives, just a few minutes away. And Judas, I'm sure that even that dark night as he's waiting in the shadows, as he's beginning to remember what happened not that long ago. It may be like just a blur of his memory because everything happened so quick. He walked up to Jesus, a few words were said. He planted a kiss on his cheek. Oh, there were some angry comments. There was yelling and all kinds of stuff going on by Peter and the others. And then Jesus was arrested and he was taken away. The man in the shadows, Judas Iscariot, held in his hand a bag that had 30 pieces of silver. I don't know if he even bothered to count it. No one noticed him now, that long night. You know what Judas Iscariot had become to everybody else around him? He was yesterday's news. It didn't matter. He didn't count. No one had any use for a traitor. But through that long night, he waited. I picture him sort of the guy that's hanging around at the edges of the crowd. Maybe trying to pick up a little bit what's, what's really happening here, listening for some word of how things were going. Now, we don't know what he expected. But if at midnight he wanted to see Jesus die... I think we can understand from Scripture, by sunrise, he, want, he, he wanted to change his mind from that decision he had made hours earlier. I would think memories would, would begin to have flooded his mind, thinking about 
what it was to be around Jesus. This one he had literally had in his hands, the, he had him sentenced to death through his betrayal. He'd remember the things that Jesus said. He was a band of merry men, a group of 12 disciples. I'm sure maybe memories came back into his mind. Think about the little jokes that they shared back and forth with each other as they traveled throughout the land. Maybe he, they even had this little joke with each other that as Jesus began to teach, they would, Judas or Peter or James or John or somebody would elbow one of the other ones and says, I think we've heard this one before. <laughs> little pictures of life with Jesus began to sneak into his mind. He would... He would think about the, that smile on the face of Jairus' daughter when Jesus raised her from the dead and how happy that family was. He could never forget that look on Peter's face when he walked on water and it held him up. And just think about the picture he might have seen of those 12 baskets full fish and bread after Jesus had fed 5,000 people. Things like that began to come back. He could see it all. He could, he could hear it all. And the memories, the memories were almost too much to bear now in his life. Then he heard the news. Jesus has been condemned to die. They shouldn't have been surprised, but he probably was. I mean, for, for a brief moment, there was a lot of commotion in the courtyard, and, and as Judas on the edge of the crowd, they, he could see Jesus as he was being led away to Pilate. And he knew. He knew what a terrible mistake he had made. I can't imagine. He must have felt so overwhelmed. Overwhelmed with the thought that Jesus was going to die. He knew then for sure that he had made a terrible mistake, the greatest mistake in his life. So great a mistake that now then he's got to find somehow, some way to get all of this change. He's got to make things right. And so with that thought in his mind, he took that bag of money and he tried to give it back. But the chief priest, they would just laugh at him. They had no more use for him. They had no more use of that money. They had what they wanted. In a moment of desperation, Judas cries out, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Every word was true because he had done exactly that. What he had done was the worst sin imaginable. He had betrayed the Lord Jesus, who, though he was innocent, was about to pay with his blood for Judas's crime. And with that, Judas looked at that bag of silver in his hand, and he just threw it into the temple. As Judas turned to go, those 30 pieces of silver stayed behind where he had tossed it. Judas not only had lost his Lord, but he lost his money as well too. And very shortly, he's going to lose his life. After taking his life, there may be very little that needs to be said. We know that he went out the Bible tells us, and hanged himself. It was really the final act of a man who could not live with himself and the memory of what he had done. Here is the ultimate irony of this tragedy. 
Judas died before Jesus did. Now, here's, as we think about Judas and this, here's some remarkable facts about his life because it wasn't always that way. He was personally chosen to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's one of the, he's one of the 12 that Scripture says forsook all to follow the Lord. He spent three and a half years traveling all over Israel with Jesus. He saw the miracles of Jesus in person. He heard in person the teachings of Jesus. He watched as Jesus raised the dead, healed the sick, cast out demons. He, along with the other apostles, were sent out to preach the gospel. He was one of the leaders of that band of apostles, and no one ever suspected him to be the one who would betray Jesus. Now, whatever we can say, think about this. Whatever we can say about Peter, James, and John, we can also say about Judas. Everywhere they went, he went also. He was right there, always by the side of Jesus. He heard it all. He experienced it all. And however we want to explain his betrayal, his defection, we cannot say that he was less experienced than the other apostles. He experienced everything Peter, James, and John, and the others had experienced. If anything, he was one of the leaders. As a matter of fact, they picked him to handle the money. Now, you don't pick a man whose loyalty you suspect to handle the money. You pick who you consider to be your best man. That'd be crazy not to do that. You pick the one that's the most trustworthy, the one know that you can count on. That's why they picked Judas Iscariot to be their treasure. And the most interesting part of this story is that the other apostles, with all the things we know about Judas Iscariot today, the other apostles saw something positive about Judas Iscariot. It wasn't until they began to look back after the fact that they could see the negative things in his life. Before he betrayed Jesus, he looked just as good as any of the other disciples. Maybe even better than most. So on that note, let me say this. No one suspected Judas. No one. So that leads us maybe to ask a couple of questions. If we could for Judas, two things that would perplex, that perplex us about his life. One of them is, why did, why did Judas betray Jesus? Over the centuries, great minds have pondered that question. And you look at commentaries, you look at other kind of resources, you can come up with sort of three common theories. One theory is, of course, he betrayed Jesus for the money. It really kind of makes sense. You, now you look back, because over in John chapter 12, verse 6, we read about how Jesus stole, Judas stole money from the money bag. But if he betrayed Jesus simply for the money, he, he betrayed him too cheaply. 30 pieces of silver, one commentator said, would be somewhere around like $20, $30 today. Maybe it was for the money. Maybe he betrayed Jesus because he was disillusioned. That's probably the, the most prevailing theory of why he did it. Judas was, a, was sort of a, a, a political operative. He had certain expectations of what Jesus was going to do. And one of them, Jesus was going to lead an uprising against Rome and, and set the people free from the Roman rule. And then when he found out that Jesus had no such intentions, he became angry and betrayed him because he didn't need Jesus anymore. They'd find someone else to do that. Maybe he betrayed Jesus because he was frightened. He was scared. He knew what the, 
what the political mood was like in, in Jerusalem. He, he heard all the conspiracy theories that there were out there. He knew that Jesus had been, th been threatened to, to be arrested and killed. So maybe he saw the storm clouds gathering around Jesus, and he betrayed the Lord so that he could save his own skin. So he wouldn't be counted with one of those, and they be put to death as well too. Now, probably as we think about these three things, all of these make sense, and all three of them might contribute to the answer, why did Judas betray Jesus? But after all of the discussions is over with, we really, really don't know why. He did what he did. But this much is sure. When Judas betrayed Jesus, he made the biggest mistake any man can ever make. Maybe the next question, why did he feel such remorse? Well, I think that's a pretty simple answer to that question is, Judas was like us, all of us on the inside, torn by opposite impulses. Have you? I'm sure you have. I know I have. I have in the last three or four weeks, dealing with a lot of stuff, torn about, all right, if I do this, I need to do this, and, that, and then I think about, I'm making this decision to do this, I feel bad. And then you begin to think, maybe I shouldn't do that at all. And you know what I mean. We, we go back and forth. It's like watching a tennis match. What do we do? Back and forth. He was torn by opposite impulses. He should have been better. Or maybe we can look at it and say, you know what? He should have been worse. If he had been, if he had been better... He would never have betrayed the Lord. If he had been worse, he wouldn't have felt so miserable about doing it. He was caught. And he died a tragic death, miserable and guilt-ridden, with the blood of the Son of God on his hands. We, we've read what Peter said. So maybe there's a question that we would ask Peter today. The question is, where is Judas today? We already said he's been a follower of Christ, been with him all the way through, heard his teaching, saw the miracles, forsook all to follow him. So where's Judas today? Is he in heaven or is he in hell? Now the Bible is very clear on this point. Scripture says that he is in hell. Peter spoke of Judas who left his apostolic ministry by betraying Jesus to go to his own place. His own place is hell. Now these words may seem a little harsh, but let me read for you over in John chapter 6, verses 70 and 71. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus answers them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Who what Jesus called him? We said, we called him a name. Jesus called him a name. He called him a devil. Because he knew what was in Judas's heart. Over in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for his disciples. This time, Judas is left to make the final arrangements. and Probably even now, the soldiers are gathering to march to the Mount of Olives to arrest Jesus. And in this, in this prayer of Jesus that night, in John 17, 12, he prayed, 
talking to his father. It says, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, talking about his disciples, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Judas is in hell today, and I'm going to tell you, he's been there over 2,000 years now. And he will be there forever. He has paid the ultimate price for the crime of betraying the Son of God. Now that triggers another question. Did Judas lose his salvation? And the answer is no. He didn't lose his salvation because he never had it. Whatever else we can say about him, he was never that complete heart-driven follower of Jesus Christ in the same sense as the other apostles. So he was not saved and then lost. He was lost because he was never saved in the first place. And it pains me as much, this pains me so much to say this, but I'm going to tell you, Judas is not the first there will be other people who have who've called them name, themselves as Christians, and they have said, Lord, Lord, and at some point in time, Jesus is going to say, their judgment's going to say, I don't even know who you are. And they will bust hell wide open because they have not heartfelt followers. They haven't really given their life to Christ. Another question might come up. Well, did Judas go to hell because he took his own life? That question comes up many times in circumstances. And the answer again is no. That's not why he went to hell. He went to hell because he betrayed and said no to the Lord Jesus Christ. Taking one's life is not God's will. It's sin. But that isn't why Judas went to hell. Judas went to hell because he never truly committed himself to Jesus Christ. His betrayal proved that, and taking his own life sealed that fate. Now, some of you who may have an older translation, you may raise another question that says, doesn't the Bible say that Judas repented? Well, some of the older translations use that word in Matthew chapter 27, verse 3. But a more accurate rendering of that is he was seized with remorse. And although Judas was gripped with the wrongness of what he had done, he never asked for forgiveness. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. There are, there's a world of difference between those two things, of having remorse and asking for forgiveness. Many people who truly feel sorry for their sins never come to God and ask for forgiveness. Now, we know that Judas tried to undo his betrayal, but it was too late. I have no doubt that he was weeping bitter tears as he threw that money back into the temple. But his remorse, as sincere as it was, was not true repentance that led to forgiveness. It didn't happen. It led instead to him taking his own life, the ultimate proof that Jesus, Judas died in unforgiven man. So that leaves us three questions we need to think about our own lives. We've shared the story. We can see all the kinds of things that Judas Iscariot dealt with that night. And as we think about this sad story of Judas, several questions come to the surface. These are questions not about Judas, but these are questions about you and me. They ask us to consider how much of a Judas Iscariot lives inside of each of us? 
And before we think about these questions, I want you to think about this. I don't know where the quote came from. Probably from that poorly paid man named Anonymous. <laughs> the more religious you are, the more likely you are to do what Judas did. Just think about that. The more religious you are, the more likely you are to do what Judas did. If Judas were alive today, the best place we could find him on a Sunday morning would be somewhere in church. Amen. He would come early. He would sit near the front. Yeah, some of you are saying, Lord, is it I? So. <laughs> he would sing the hymns with gusto and excitement. He may even clap his hands and raise his hands as he sung. He may even say amen during the sermon. You know, if Judas lived in Green Valley, I bet he would be a member of Green Valley Baptist Church. So think about that. He was that kind of a person. We'd, we'd have him on the finance team in no time short. <laughs> we laugh. But who knows? He might be sitting, he or she might be sitting next to you right now. Let me ask you these three questions. This kind of points to what Judas was dealing with in his life. This is the question you ask yourself. You've got to answer it. How has God disappointed you? I think if there's any way to understand Judas, it's at this point a personal disappointment. I'm sure that he was thinking Jesus has let him down. He was not doing what Judas Iscariot wanted him to do. And so in his own twisted way, he felt it was the right thing to do to betray Jesus so that this Roman, oppressive Roman rule could be eliminated eventually from the nation of Israel and they would be free once more. And if Jesus was standing in the way of that, then this was going to have to happen But is this so much different than when we feel maybe like God has let us down somehow or another? That God, God, I pray, I wanted you to do this. God, I ask you to do this. And God, you're saying no. Or God, you, you're, you're not even, I don't feel like you're even talking to me right now. So I'm going to ask you the question this morning. I want you to think about this. How has God disappointed you? For some, it may be a shattered dream and a hope that's never been realized. For others, you've been praying for so long for your family, for your marriage, and the marriage has failed. You've been praying for your children and dreams and hopes for them the children have turned against you. Maybe you've had a loved one that's been dying of cancer. We have a lot of, I'm just using that as an illustration in this community of believers. And you have prayed and prayed, oh God, please heal that, my loved one. And you had to plan a funeral. Maybe you feel deep inside that God has, hasn't simply lived up to his end of the bargain. And though you would never say it here in church, somehow or another you feel cheated by the Lord. Here's a fact. Oftentimes God does not live up to our expectations. 
He doesn't do what we think he ought to do. And when those thoughts come into our mind, we need to remember he's God and we're not. Amen. Judas could have been certainly disappointed. He, he felt like he couldn't live with disappointment, so he betrayed. Where have you dropped back or cut back on because it's not, everything's not going the way I want it to go? I don't like the way the preacher dresses. I don't like the way he preaches, the way he talks. I don't like the way the music's going. I don't like, you just pick out a checklist. And so we say, you know what? God, I'm just pulling back because it's not going my way. Second question, what would you trade for Jesus? We've already said Judas was willing to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. It wasn't worth much. Really, Judas went to hell, and the cost of his ticket was just those 30 pieces of silver of silver. So think about it. What would you betray Jesus for? What would you trade for Jesus? More money? To save your own skin? Because he didn't live up to your own expectations? Because he thought that he let you down? The story of Judas asked us to probe at the very level of our personal motivation. Ask ourselves this question, why do we serve the Lord anyway? And how much is the Son of God worth to you? And one last question, maybe the hardest. Are you a second Judas? Many years ago, an evangelist preached a sermon with the title, A Second Judas. And that, and that sermon was really aimed at people who called themselves church members, but who had never been, never been saved. And that can happen to any of us. Judas kissed the door of heaven, but he went to hell. Jesus picked him as an apostle, but he went to hell. He lived with Jesus for three years, and he still went to hell. He listened to the Sermon on the Mount and still went to hell. He ate with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He listened to Jesus day after day, month after month, year after year. He knew Jesus as well as anyone had ever known Jesus, and he still went to hell. And if you're sitting there this morning wanting to cover your ears right now, look at your heart. And remember, none of, his, of the disciples suspected him. Even at the Last Supper when Jesus identified Judas publicly, they still couldn't figure it out. As I thought about this question, do you know who is most likely to be a Judas in this church? I am. As a senior pastor, I stand in the closest analogy to the place of where Judas stood. And some of you who like me, who love me and are my friends, you may say, no, no, John, it couldn't be you. But that's what they said about Judas. And if I can stand up here this morning and tell you this story without searching my own heart, then I have missed the point. This is one thing I want you to know this morning. I want you to know that I truly believe in the assurance of salvation through the Word of God and the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in that assurance. 
I, and really, I'm not a person that's always in favor of constant uh, introspection about, all right, if I do this, does it mean I'm saved or I'm not saved? I'm not talking about those things like that. Now, there's a time and place for healthy self-examination of the Christian life. None, no one in this room should take for granted heaven or hope for heaven. And if I'm a Christian at all, it's not because I'm the pastor of this church or director of missions for Catalina Baptist Association or a church member or a husband or a father, a doer of good things. None of those things matter in the least when it comes to eternal salvation. As a Christian, it's all because we're trusting in Jesus Christ and Him alone for the forgiveness of sin. I'm telling you this morning, I'm staking my hope on, the hev on heaven that the fact that Jesus died for me and rose from the dead. And if Jesus can't take me to heaven, then I'm not going there. That is what gets us to that hope for eternal life. And Judas really does us a favor if his story causes us to rethink our basic commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, I think most of us in this room would say, yes, I'm a Christian. But the deeper question is, are you a true follower or are you just going through the motions? Are you a pretender to being a true believer? Have you truly turned from your sins and trusted Christ as Savior? Are you a fair-weather friend of the Savior? Now, these are searching questions, and I'm going to tell you, they're a whole lot easier to ask than they are to answer. But the one main lesson from Judah's life is lost unless we at least ask ourselves the question. Think about it. If one can be an apostle of Christ and still be lost, where does that leave you and me? Perhaps we conclude the matter this way. One apostle was lost, but 11 were saved. And for those of us who have truly given our life to Christ, there's no room for despair. Amen. In the end, those of us who've given their life to Christ, Asking ourselves these questions may come to the conclusion, although I fail him in so many ways, I do love Jesus, and I claim him as my Savior. And even though I'm a failure at times, I won't to live for Him. The story of Judas is in the Bible for many reasons, not the least of which is that before we take anything for granted, we at least ask the question the other apostles asked that night. Lord, is it I? wrestle with that. Maybe there's something this morning as we come to the invitation that you need to seek forgiveness for in your walk and your relationship with, with Him. Maybe this morning you're thinking, and Hear my, hear my heart, folks. I haven't done this sermon to confuse anyone. I've shared this message because it comes from God's Word, and when you're preaching through a particular chapter, those are the next verses that we came to. And we can't hide from those. We've got to address the hard facts, the hard things. This is not a sermon to confuse you. It's a sermon for you to really look deep in your heart and your life. to see where you are in your commitment to following Christ. I know our time's up. So now then, it's, as we come to the conclusion of the service, as I have wrestled with this throughout 
the past couple of weeks. May the Holy Spirit give you assurance and hope being a follower of Christ. May he bring conviction that there's something needs to change in your life concerning the risen Lord and Savior who died on the cross for your sins. Maybe God's asking of you today that you've been kind of just playing along, sitting in the chairs, enjoying everything going on. God says, I got something else for you to do. I want you to give me a different level of commitment of following me because I gave my son who gave his all. What will you give me today? It's not to make us do work. It's to bring honor and glory to God. What say you? I'm going to pray. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. And as God moves this morning, we invite you to come forward. Turn these steps again into a prayer altar. There's no reason to be embarrassed. There's no reason to feel humiliated. Because I think everyone in this room wants the same thing, to see as many people go to heaven as we can see. Many people serving the Lord as we can see. Many people enjoying the fellowship and the wonderful love that we have as a church family. We invite you. Let's pray. Father, in these moments, we've asked some hard questions. It's a matter of some examining our hearts and our lives. It's a matter of being willing to be yielded to you and trust you and obey. May our prayer be this morning, Father, I want to live for you. And while I'm here on this earth, make my life count for your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together.